good, I get to follow Duncan. How would you all like to have to follow him? <laughs> um, I thought I'd start out with a little risky thing, just to get everybody in the mood. Uh, I was traveling up the coast here, and we stopped at a hotel the other night. And I don't know if some of you ladies have incontinence sometimes. But, or how many of you guys have ever dreamed you were going to the bathroom? Lots of you, okay. Well, that's what I was dreaming, and I was dreaming I had to go to the bathroom, and I was looking for a toilet, and I was looking for a restroom for about an hour. Finally found a restroom, sat down, and peed. All of a sudden, I woke up, and I thought, oh, wow. I missed that one. I get to head to the bathroom, and I felt something warm. Something moist around me, you know, and I thought, uh-oh. But you know, the reason I'm telling you this person is because I learned something really important about that. I learned that dreams really do come true. <laughs> I wanted to laugh. Makes me feel better. You know, a theater is very intimidating. I like a bar where people have had four or five drinks. You know. um, this is kind of a mixed blessing. I don't know if anybody saw the poet contest last night, but they had eight people and they could only find six. And when I got home at midnight and checked my e-phone, my iPhone, I had an email that I had been one of the contestants. Uh, I would have been a little bit perturbed, except that the guys were so great last night that I thank God I hadn't had to get up there and, and be the loser. <laughs> so it was like a mixed blessing. And, and then I thought, well, at least my poem was that good. It got in the eight one tops, you know. So this is the poem. And I'd like you all to kind of clap afterwards, because my son's got a meter on his iPhone that shows uh, the claps. <laughs> And I want to know what you think, but I want you to lie. Because <laughs> poets have, you know, they're a little bit touchy about their, their ego and their poems. They get a little bit uh, uh, fragile. It's called Spring. I live in Oregon now. Spring comes gently. Baby lambs. The smell of fresh green grass and gentle rain on my skin. Primroses appear, red, purple, yellow, and wild rhododendrons everywhere as the earth comes quietly alive. But once I lived in Alaska, in a fishing town. Spring is different there. The smells, the colors, no green grass, only gravel everywhere. First come icy winds whipping down the glaciers through the town. Then the rains. Get out the full dress rain gear. It's going to be a wet one today. Snow begins to melt with an energy you can feel. The honking sounds of sandhill cranes and geese heading north. Noisy outboards in the harbor. The smell of engines, gasoline, and oil fumes. On the docks, men yelling to each other, heaving nets onto their boats. The sure sign of spring is the coffee shop, crowded with fishermen, voices raised, rumors flying concerning the weather, the season, the price of fish. Cordova coming alive. I miss it. No red and purple primroses, only gray pussy willows. No gentle rains, only howling gales. No lambs, only fish spawning in the bay. Cordova in the springtime. I miss it. This is my second poem. Uh, it's called A Fisherman's Memoir. When I was 14, my dad stowed us away on a fish tender bound for Alaska, three sisters with no say. That summer, they called us floating cannery girls. We learned to slime a fish, clean a clam, cook trout over an open fire on the beach with the boys. I didn't mind a new world the old one left behind. 
landed in Cordova, married a fisherman. All summer the men fished and the women worked the canneries. Not me, I cried, I'm going fishing too. I'll be part of the crew. No women on a boat back then. Bad luck, the men muttered. You only get a quarter share. But they took me in a pinch to cook, count fish, and run the winch. No, they didn't like a woman on the boat. But weekends found a dozen boats tied to ours, stories over coffee, and my lemon pies. <laughs> Eventually, I was accepted. I was the captain's wife. So it continued for me, a fisherwoman's life. But then came a surprise. One summer, I brought aboard two young fishers. That's right, the kids. Danny, he worked the back deck and piled high the nets. Donnie, she pushed the corks away whenever we made sets. Both of them jumped down in the fish hole, pitched their shell of fish. We teased them, what more could one wish? We were a fishing family, that's how they were raised and how it was to be. Even now they fish, they love Alaska, their boats, and most of all, the sea. Okay, you all know that the captain makes the decisions on a boat, whether it's a rowboat or a giant boat. This is called the iceberg. It's midnight and we're going with the tide. The tide? What are we, a sailboat? I was in the galley arguing with Ed, my husband. We have no business going down Valdez Arm in the dark. Nothing, no radar, nothing but the iron mic. It's winter. We could hit a log or an iceberg out there. Nah, they're never up in the arm this far. Columbia Glacier's right around the corner. Hello? But no use. He was determined and he was the captain and perfectly capable of handling any emergencies. <laughs> Only him and me on this trip. We were running the winter mail run to all the canneries and villages on the Sound. And this was our last stop before we docked in Cordova and he was in a hurry. Now I never felt comfortable sleeping down in the forecastle when we were running, so I climbed up into an upper bunk by the wheelhouse to rest. Ed was up in the pilot house, just him and Iron Mike. Crash! I jumped out of my bunk and I ran out on the deck, but Ed was already there with a huge flashlight, and there it was, an iceberg, as big as a mountain alongside us. We slid past it, we heard it scraping the side of the boat. Ed shone a flashlight down the side. Oh my God, there was a huge gash just above the waterline. It had to be about 20 feet long. What do you want me to do, I yelled. Just steer straight ahead, he yelled back. I looked back through the galley to the deck and he was filling the lifeboat with water. Then he swung her over with the boom to the far side. I could see what he was doing. This made the boat list that way, so the gash on the other side rose, higher above the water line. It worked. Now the gash was about six inches above water. Then we climbed down in the forecastle to stuff mattresses into the hole to try and close the gap a little. I saw that my bunk had been smashed against the bulkhead. Whoa, if I'd have been there sleeping, that would have been the end of me. I was pissed off that we had even gotten in this predicament. <laughs> we limped home very, very slow, and I watched the weather for any signs of wind coming up, which would have caused waves against the side. But we were lucky. It was calm. It took us 12 hours instead of the normal two. And all along the way, the more I thought about it, the madder I got. <laughs> But Ed was a hero when we got to town. He had saved us and the boat. He grinned, proud of himself. What do you think? That was pretty great, huh? I looked him in the eye. You dumb shit.
But it, just a thought, man. Maybe instead of being glad that her husband is the hero who rescues her from a situation, just maybe she would rather you had listened to her and not gotten in that situation in the first place. And I have a little limerick. There once was a man who was nice, but he never took any advice. His wife's he dismissed, and she got really pissed when his boat paid the ultimate price. called To the Knife. How many fishermen in here? Few? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. There's an old knife sheath that's about 70 years old. It sits in the bottom drawer in Danny's gill netter. Belonged to his dad in the 1950s when things were handmade. A big chunk of leather with some copper rivets in it. Burnish green with salt water and thyme. It didn't matter what kind of knife you had, fish slimer's knife, whatever, just so that it was sharp and you had a good sheath to protect it and yourself. When Ed died, Dan and his sister and a boatload of the family took his ashes out and spread them off an island where he used to deer hunt. But before we left, they both strapped on the sheath and knives he had left them. It only seemed right. This is, this is about four little stories about a knife. This is Dan Bilderback's log. Alaska, 1970, 17 years old, May. He fished the Copper River Flats. Went on a date one night and left my sheath knife at home. Left for fishing the next morning without it. Southeast storm down by Egg Island Light on a large minus ebb. No one around. Ned out, kicker won't start, and 300 feet from shore in the whirlpooliest water you ever saw. In a small doghouse skiff, scared and knowing this was it. Hank Stewart was coming in from the ocean and came over, threw me a knife to cut my gear loose and cut the anchor line that wouldn't catch and hold. He threw me a line and told me to an anchorage. Thanks, Hank. 50 years ago, and 50 years that he gave me. Hank died in January 2014. The next one's called The Story of the Hiley. That same summer, I went sailing with my grandpa and grandma on his boat, the Hiley. Towards the end of the season, the boat ran up on a rock and capsized. It happened fast. Water rushed into the galley and over us. We tumbled out the door onto deck and I swam as quick as I could overboard and away from the sinking boat. He's still 16. I swam over to Grandma with a floating cooler for her to hang on to. I was feeling colder and colder. So now we were all in the water except Bill, the one crew member who couldn't swim. He had run up along the keel, which was now clear out of the water, and was shouting, help, I can't swim, throw me your knife. We all knew that if the boat went down, the skiff tied so tightly on the back would go down with it, and we would not make it to shore. I looked at him and the distance between us, nothing but water in between, and I yelled back, no way in hell. There was no way I was gonna throw that knife for him to catch, or maybe miss. So I swam over to the side of the boat, pulled out my knife, and I handed it to him to cut the line. I climbed aboard the skiff and Bill and I rode over to Grandma and Grandma and heaped them aboard. They were shaking. It was June, but the water was still freezing. We rode to shore, started a fire, and sat there for hours till a boat cruising the beach spotted us, Radio Cordova, for a plane to take us in. For a short time, I had a small hero status in town. I've never understood it when someone gets called a hero for doing the logical thing. I think people just like to make heroes. The real hero was the knife. Sometimes, when we had been running all night to a certain bay, Ed would put a crew member on the wheel and climb into the upper bunk for a little snooze. I would climb up there too, just to sleep a little and cuddle. 
How many saners out there? Hmm. Well, anyway, they know how tight a bunk can be, even for one person. Soon I would turn over. Ed, can't you take that darn knife sheath off just to sleep? <laughs> Sorry, hon, might need it. <laughs> and now a little sad story. They're not all positive stories, you know that, fishermen. Ed was fishing southeast that fall with the Valiant Maiden crew in 1953. His brother Don had come along to fly the plane and spot fish for us. They would be gone two months. My son was six months old, so I had to stay behind in Cordova this time. One day I got a call to run down to the ACS office. I had a long distance call. Back in the 50s, we didn't have a long distance telephone. If you had a long distance call, it was usually an emergency, and it came through the Alaska communication system, which you ran up into town there and used their two-way radio phone. I had to explain that because it's been so long ago. I had a long distance call. The line was full of static. I could hardly make out who was on the other end. I just heard bits and pieces about a plane crash. Who is this? Who am I talking to? I yelled in the phone. Finally, I heard him say, it's Ed. Don had been missing from a flight to a lake that weekend. He and his girlfriend were going sport fishing. The lake was notorious for its wicked downdrafts. One caught the plane coming in on landing, and the trees tore off a wing crashed into the lake. Ed chartered a plane to look for him and found the plane. Both Don and the girl were dead. Ed dove down to recover his brother's body and found the knife. Don had pulled it out of his sheath, cut halfway through his seatbelt before he lost consciousness. Okay, there's a little lighter one here. <clears throat> this is called the New Gilnet. Danny Carpenter and his friend were on the dock getting ready for their first opening and loading up their new gill net and admiring it. They had saved a long time for this. And gill nets nowadays are about $3,500, so you can imagine you know, how expensive it was to them. An old fisherman was walking by on his way to his boat. That's a pretty nice net you got there. Then he grinned at both of them. But don't be afraid to cut her loose. Danny laughed, too good a net for that. That afternoon, the storm caught them, and their gill netter drifted closer to the breakers. They tried to tow the net away, but it was too heavy. So they turned the boat around, thinking to tow it forward, it would have more power. In making the turn, the net fouled the props, and the engine stopped. Danny and his friend took one look at each other and ran for the back with their knives out and began slashing the net away from the prop, and then they cut her loose. Now I'm told that not every fisherman carries that knife nowadays because of regulations, travel, whatever, but on most gill netters, there's a sheath made of plastic or leather. It's placed on the bow, taped, riveted, whatever, bolted. It's placed on the bow near the steering helm. Within whatever it takes to hold it firm, it is made to hold a knife within easy reach of the fisherman when he is bringing in or letting out the net. It doesn't matter what kind of knife, only that he keeps it sharp. And an interesting story, my friend says it's the same on a farm. A farmer never goes out without his knife, no telling when you might need it. Her mother's 92, and the other day she asked her in the car, I gotta open this package. Mom, do you happen to have a knife? Yep. She pulled it out of her purse. Never go anywhere without it. <laughs> so if you were in the bar and I was doing this, I would say, let's raise our glasses in a toast to the knife and all the fishermen who've ever had to use them. So next time you're in one of the bars, do that for me. Toast to the knife. Toast to the knife. And I'll, I'll end this with um, keep your net wet, catch all you can, but know when to cut or lose. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for being such a great audience.